I was very realistic. I, you know, if I had, you know, I thought two years was like uh, cartwheels. Two years is like unicorn rainbows. You know, that was like, that was really good. So yeah, I knew it was going to come back and I was just hoping to get a couple years. So I, I achieved that and I was happy with that. You know, no one's happy to relapse, but I was fully prepared for that as much as you can be. Welcome to the Myeloma Matters podcast, hosted by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, focusing on patients' experiences with and perspectives on multiple myeloma topics that matter to anyone affected by this blood cancer. In this episode, we tackle the difficult topic of what happens when a patient's treatment doesn't work or stops working. You'll hear from three patients who faced this situation and learn how they navigated the stressful process of making decisions about their treatments, including how they approached discussions with their healthcare team to determine the best plan for this new stage of their diagnosis. Please note that every myeloma patient is unique. The information in this podcast is not intended to replace the services or advice of trained healthcare professionals. Please consult your healthcare team or contact the MMRF Patient Navigation Center at 1-888-841-6673 if you have specific questions about your health. Also, if you'd like to support this podcast series, we'd love for you to leave a comment or review wherever you get your podcasts. When myeloma patients receive their first line of therapy, that is, their initial therapy after they've been diagnosed with myeloma, the goal is for the treatment to induce a long period of remission. Unfortunately, some patients don't respond to this initial treatment. Their myeloma is considered resistant or refractory to the treatment. Even patients who do respond are likely to eventually experience a return of the disease, also known as a relapse. Multiple myeloma is a chronic disease that is characterized by several cycles of remission and relapse. Relapse can be described in one of two ways. In a clinical relapse, the patient experiences new or returning symptoms, such as bone pain or kidney problems. More commonly, however, myeloma returns as what is called a biochemical relapse, This happens when a patient has no symptoms or perhaps only mild symptoms, but is found to have indicators of myeloma, for example, M protein in the blood or urine. This was the case for our first guest, David Franks, who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2016. Shortly after receiving his diagnosis, David started induction therapy followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. He initially responded well to his transplant and had planned to enroll in a maintenance therapy clinical study. When he went in for screening for the study, however, his blood work revealed that his myeloma was back. And it was back with a vengeance. Um, I had, I did not feel bad at that point. You know, I had no real pain going on, no new pain, uh, but it was back heavily. To catch relapse early, it's important for patients to continue seeing their doctor regularly, even when they're in remission. Keeping up with regular visits gives the healthcare team the opportunity to conduct the blood tests or imaging tests that can provide the first signs of returning myeloma. For Mark Herkert, who you heard from at the top of our program, it took two stem cell transplants to get a response after his diagnosis. Mark's remission lasted two years, at which point signs of returning myeloma appeared in his blood work. He was started on a high dose of Revlimid, which helped him achieve another two-year remission. But his myeloma returned again. And then that started to wane, and um, then I blew through several therapies really fast. Our final guest, John Bush, was first diagnosed with smoldering myeloma in 2006. After three years of monitoring his blood work, John's healthcare team decided to initiate treatment. He received induction therapy with Revlimid, Velcade, and dexamethasone, but opted not to get a stem cell transplant at that time. 
Over the next several years, John went on and off a variety of therapeutic regimens that helped him achieve and reachieve remission. Following one of his relapses, John's healthcare team recommended that he enroll in a clinical study for treatment with a new drug. So they put me in the clinical trial for that, and they thought, you know, I could, yeah, so let's see how that goes. And, you know, even though I had responded to every previous treatment, you know, pretty much, you know, pretty well, you know, this was kind of a dud. You know, it was surprising and, you know, and and kind of, I mean, disconcerting, but kind of in a fundamental way. Like, some sometime when you have uh, an experience that kind of shakes your worldview a little bit. So, you know, I realized that I had been kind of operating with this, you know, kind of sense that, oh, treatment's going to work for me. It's just going to keep working. And then when this one didn't work and it's touted as, you know, oh, the immunotherapies, I mean, this is the new frontier. It's going to change everything, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't work for me. And then I really had, it kind of shook me. And all of a sudden, I came around to stem cell transplant. There are many effective treatments available for relapsed or refractory myeloma, with more being tested in clinical studies all the time. These treatments can help patients get their disease back to a place where they are able to continue with their everyday lives. When choosing a therapy at relapse, whether it's the patient's first relapse, second relapse, or more, Doctors take into consideration a number of factors, including the patient's disease features, treatment history, medical history, and treatment preferences. Disease-related factors that may influence treatment include considerations such as the genetics of the patient's myeloma and the pattern of relapse. David was initially diagnosed with a high-risk form of myeloma, characterized by a chromosomal abnormality that increased his likelihood for relapse. This may have been the reason he relapsed so quickly after his stem cell transplant, and it suggested to his healthcare team that he may need a more aggressive form of treatment. A patient's treatment history can also help doctors determine what medications to try or to avoid. This can include what treatments have or haven't already been tried, as well as what side effects the patient may have experienced with prior therapies. John, for instance, experienced peripheral neuropathy from his Velcade treatment, which meant that that agent should be avoided in future treatments. I routinely warn new patients, you know, if you go on Velcade, you've got to be so vigilant about paying attention to all all the little things. So, you know, most people, and I'm, you know, I'm in that camp, they're not paying attention to every little thing that's going on in their body, you know. You know, we're not really trained that way, and that's not, I mean, that's not how we are, you know, uh, in, in, in this modern age where we're tuned into the body and all the subtleties of the things that are happening. John also hadn't received a stem cell transplant as part of his initial treatment, which meant that he could get one later after his disease relapsed. The patient's preferences and needs can also influence what treatments are considered after relapse. These include other health problems a person may have, such as heart problems or diabetes, and how treatment will affect a person's lifestyle. Patients are encouraged to take part in their treatment decision-making and to communicate their preferences. Both John and Mark wanted less intensive approaches to their treatments. They communicated those preferences to their healthcare teams and advocated for drug holidays following some of their treatments. They wanted to get me on Rev, and I thought, I only got so many bullets in my gun, and I don't want to blow through that one when it's not pressing. Right now, I am, the myeloma's uh, under control, and uh, I wanted to push out the rev as long as possible. So for two years, I did zip. I didn't do anything, and um, that was great. It's funny, um, my doctor, I mean, we, we have this kind of mutual, respectful, but 
sometimes, you know, borderline combative relationship. At least it, it was like that, you know, in the early days. I don't know. I think he seemed to, you know, eventually accept. And he, I remember him bringing in, you know, a medical fellow to the appointment. I mean, frequently he's bringing in somebody. And, you know, one of the times he said to the fellow, oh, okay, this is the patient who tells us what we're going to do. So, yeah, so I was very, you know, pretty, I mean, I was very emphatic about what I wanted, what I didn't want, and so forth. And so, you know, so now, like, he's looking for opportunities to, you know, to not only accommodate, but, you know, help me, you know, have drug holidays, you know. So even though he's definitely in the camp of beat it down and keep it down, but still, yeah, we're you know, we're kind of muddling along. Different types of therapies are available for relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma based on the number of treatments a patient has received. Some treatments can be used for patients who've had three or fewer therapies who are said to be in the early relapse stages. Currently, other treatments such as immunotherapies are reserved for patients who received more than three therapies. Treatments for early relapse myeloma are frequently given in a combination regimen, that is, two, three, or even four drugs administered together as part of a treatment plan. For instance, a monoclonal antibody, such as Darzalex or Sarclisa, may be given alongside an immunomodulatory drug, such as Revlimid or Pomalist or Proteasome Inhibitor such as Velcade or Kyprolis, along with a steroid. There are other drug combinations that include a drug in another class called Expovio-2. The combination of drugs chosen for one's patient's relapse may be different from those used for another patient when considering their risk factors, treatment history, and preferences. Indeed, David, Mark and John have all received some combination of these drug classes for their relapse, but the approaches have been individualized based on their specific needs. After the third line of therapy, patients who relapse are more likely to have been exposed to the three main classes of drugs previously mentioned, monoclonal antibodies, immunomodulators, and proteasome inhibitors. At this point, they may no longer respond to these types of agents. These patients are what is known as triple-class refractory. Treatments for these patients include targeted immunotherapies, which include CAR T-cell therapies and bispecific antibodies. A CAR T-cell is a modified T-cell. These are generated from a patient's own white blood cells, taken from their body, and genetically engineered to express a protein that helps them bind and kill myeloma cells. Because CAR T cells are engineered from a patient's own cells, the treatment process requires many steps and takes time, typically four to six weeks. CAR T cell therapy has the advantage of being a one-and-done approach, meaning that it doesn't need to be given regularly or continuously. Two CAR T-cell therapies are currently approved by the FDA, Abecma and Carvicti. Bispecific antibodies are similar to CAR T-cells in that they bring a patient's own T-cells in close contact with myeloma cells to promote myeloma cell death. One component of the antibody binds to CD3, a protein on the surface of cancer-killing T-cells, and the other side binds to a specific protein on the surface of myeloma cells. Bispecific antibodies don't require a lengthy process to develop and prepare for individual patients. Any patient can get them immediately if they need it. This is considered an off-the-shelf treatment. However, bispecific antibodies are given regularly over time, typically every week or every two weeks, it is not a one-and-done treatment. Three bispecific antibodies have now been approved for treatment of relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma, Tecvali, Talvi, and Elrexfio. Immunotherapies such as CAR T-cells and bispecific antibodies are typically given on their own 
rather than as part of a multi-drug regimen. For more information on these therapies, our episode on targeted immunotherapy goes into detail about these options for heavily pretreated myeloma patients. Clinical studies are also available across all stages of myeloma treatment. Participation in a clinical study is not just for patients who are running out of options. For instance, David was in the early phases of enrolling in a clinical study for maintenance therapy after his stem cell transplant, before his myeloma relapsed. A clinical study gives patients the opportunity to potentially receive a form of treatment they wouldn't otherwise be able to receive. Myeloma research has evolved dramatically over the past two decades, with many new drugs becoming available. Bispecific antibodies and CAR T-cells have become newly available just within the last couple of years, and these innovations are the products of extensive research and clinical studies. John enrolled in a clinical study of a new drug after his myeloma relapsed, which unfortunately did not induce a response for him. Patients who don't respond to treatment during a clinical study may choose to explore another treatment option instead. Participation in a clinical study is always voluntary. No patient is expected to be a guinea pig for research. Cancer research and clinical studies are under very tight supervision and are held to very high standards. Doctors may encourage their patients to consider a clinical study, but patients are never obligated to participate or even continue participating after they begin. One, I trust my doctors that they wouldn't, you know, if, if this were you know, for a clinical trial, they would not, you know, obviously, and especially with all the rules and regulations regarding clinical trials, they don't just throw you in just to throw you in. You have to meet certain criteria. <clears throat> I think, again, my my health overall, my, you know, it gives me that, you know, that strength to to handle whatever they might want to trial me on. Um Again, again, also my background, knowing what clinical trials truly can accomplish, uh, I'm wide open for it. You know, I, if they if if they presented it to me, I probably wouldn't go in and say, hey, I want to be part of this trial. But <clears throat> if they presented a proper one that I would be a good candidate for, I would happily do it. To learn more about clinical studies and why they're important to patients who have multiple myeloma or one of its precursor conditions, our episode on clinical studies shares the experiences of three patients who have participated in clinical studies and the steps they took to enroll. The treatment landscape for relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma is rapidly growing with many options for patients. The continually expanding list of options offers hope to Mark. Because I, I mean, honestly now, I mean, when you get diagnosed, they don't really tell you, oh, you got X number of years to live because they don't know. The needle just keeps, keeps getting pushed. People are living longer. They don't, they don't even know now, I mean, because there's so many new things. So, um, and that's good. That's good not to have like a number thrown at you. Treatment approaches are tailored based on a variety of personal factors, including how long a patient has been in remission, how they've responded to previous treatments, and what kind of therapies they've received. To learn more about the process of treating relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma, let's turn now to Mark, John, and David, who joined the MMRF's Mary de Rome to share their perspectives and experiences with relapse over the course of their disease, how they and their doctors approached treatment decisions, and how they coped with the news of their relapse. So we're going to talk about how it feels to uh, undergo relapse once you've gone through your uh, newly diagnosed phase. Um, and being diagnosed with multiple myeloma in and of itself is really an overwhelming prospect. And so I want to talk to each of you about the impact of learning that your myeloma had relapsed after your initial treatment. So um, did you feel like you were prepared for this eventuality, considering that myeloma is uh, an incurable cancer? John, let's start with you. I've been at this for now 17 years, so I frankly can't remember um, my initial relapse, mm -hmm. and I'm not even sure what it when or what it was, um, because I've tended to follow a course that's maybe a little uh, non-conventional 
which is to seek and go on drug holidays. I think initially maybe I had a little fantasy that my drug holiday would extend for the rest of my, you know, for a long period of time, let's say, uh, an indefinite period of time. I guess I always expected it to come back and, you know, and it has. So, you know, so that's usually the end of the drug holiday is when things are relapsing and I go, well, that was fun, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I got to jump back in and, uh, you know, and then, you know, go back in. So I, I've done that a number of times. Dave, what about you? How did you feel when you found out you had relapsed? Well, mine was very short. Uh, within 90 days of my stem cell, my stem cell transplant. Uh, so it's 2017. Uh, I had my transplant at February and by middle of April, I was, uh, it was raging again. Um, so, you know, to get through, uh, get through the stem cell transplant and to feel good afterwards, finally get past all the recovery and to start feeling good again, feeling like, all right, we can, you know, just go on maintenance and beat this and just kind of carry on with my life uh, to have that, it was almost a feel, uh, feeling of failure. Like, what did I do? Like, did I do something to, to allow it to come in? Did I not take my medicine right? Uh, and then, but since then it's been going on with six, six, seven years now since that time. And I realized it wasn't, it just, it just happens. And to have that mentality then to switch to that of, it can just happen whether, no matter what you do. Uh, it actually helps help prepare me for when it when it does happen again whatever else whatever's out there they want to give you for medications that's new and you know the latest and greatest go for it so mark tell us about how it how it went for you when you learned that you had relapsed similar to john i have also taken myeloma holidays um kind of the road less traveled um similar to dave my first transplant didn't work i in essence, wound up doing a tandem, which is not how we planned it. It's just how it, it worked out. Um, and so the I would say the first year of my treatment did not go particularly well. And it's not in a great place because I didn't really have any victories. I didn't have any wins. I was just getting, you know, my ass kicked. And uh, and the few, you know, I, I didn't feel good about the future. And then once the second transplant worked and I took a holiday, then my outlook changed. And I started to look at this more of a, uh, as a chronic uh, condition, as opposed to a uh, death sentence. You know, I quickly realized early on that this was an emotional roller coaster because, you know, you'd be waiting for the results to get back and either they yeah. were mm -hmm. promising or it was going to be like, nope, things aren't working. And I was like, man, I got to get off this thing because it's just too many highs and too many lows. And so to try to even that out, I just tried to take a long term approach, which is that, you know, some days th I'm going to get good news. Some days it's not going to go the way I planned. But, you know, I I'm just not going to get too high and I'm not going to get too low. That's really helped smooth things out. Um, that's what I needed for um, my peace of mind. Like, People talk about like, oh, I'm in remission. I I never use that word remission because uh, that to me implies like I could beat myeloma. And I don't think that's ever going to happen. I mean, maybe with some of the new CAR T cell and, and bi-specific stuff, maybe, you know, myeloma ultimately has the upper hand um, in, in, up to this day and age that we find ourselves. So um, I, I try to stay away from those those terms like remission, because those are just setups for me, because it's then I, the flip side of that is the disappointment at relapse. And yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I just don't want to set myself up like that. So let's talk about, um, you know, choosing your next line of therapy after relapse. So John, I know that you've um, relapsed um, a number of times. So each time you relapse, how, how do you discuss this happening with your care team and and how do you discuss with them what the next potentially right uh, therapeutic treatment might be for you? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, in the early days, I would say there, there seemed to be, you know, counseling from the myeloma docs at the seminars and whatnot, that you wanted to have this game plan in place with this kind of long-term perspective and kind of almost like you were going to line up all the treatments 
you know, ahead, you know, way ahead of time, have them in mind and, you know, have it all like laid out with your doctor and so forth. I mean, I actually thought, how could you do that? You know, because <laughs> it's all changing. And uh, and then, you know, it turns out that my oncologist definitely doesn't want to do that. It's I've, I've been with him a long time now. And, you know, we we have a good understanding. But the way that it works with him is that, you know, when I've been on something for a while and then I prod him a little bit about what is, you know, what might be next? You know, what what are you thinking about? You know, or do you have anything in mind? And he doesn't really want to give me any much advance notice because I think he wants to maintain, you know, full flexibility to uh, introduce the best option right in the moment. And I, and I appreciate that, actually, because uh, I'll bet some people get, and I, that the, some people might be me, <laughs> might get a little fixated on what that next thing is, and then maybe be taken aback somewhat when, uh, when or, you know, if something else is, is recommended at the moment that I really need to, you know, go into the next thing. So I'm okay with it, you know, um, but at a certain point, I do kind of want to have some idea so I can bone up on uh, treatment and, and, you know, have the questions that I want to, you know, pose uh, in mind and so forth. So that's how it's gone. And, you know, because of all the activity in the myeloma, you know, area, there, there has always been something, you know, pretty promising that I've been able to step into. And that, you know, I would say the thing that's also helped my kind of hearkening back a little bit to the previous question about um, relapse and the, and the emotional impact of it is I have had pretty good responses. And so I have some confidence about something working. So I don't worry about it too much. And, uh, and then, you know, then we start something and, you know, we just uh, go along. So that's, yeah, that's, um, that's how we, you know, have handled it thus far. And, you know, so far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. So did you say you were diagnosed 19 years ago? 17 years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, back then there really weren't a whole heck of a lot of choices, but things have certainly changed in the myeloma community since then. Now there's just a plethora of things that people can be put on in different combinations and some of these new immunotherapies that are pretty amazing. And, you know, for the first time, I mean, I've been working in myeloma for nine years. And now whenever you go to these major meetings and they talk about these new therapies, doctors are starting to talk about cures. Right. So I think that we're all headed in the right direction with all these new therapies. It's still always uh, just a big decision to determine what to go on next after you after you relapse. So, Dave, how have you handled that with your care team? Well, c c kind of to go off of what John was saying regarding the, uh, you know, with, with so many, you know, you don't want to get yourself too focused on one thing. Um, and like him, I've had a great response. Uh, to when I was when I relapsed right after my uh, stem cell, I responded well with Revlimid uh, for induction. So they wanted me to stay on that, and then add in a Darzalex to that. And f I've had a great response to that for the last six years or so. So it's one of these don't rock the boat until it's rocked. You know, along with what John was saying, you know, I'm not going to focus on you know so much of oh well this one's just come out. Because if I continue to have a good response, that one may be pushed off to the side or it won't be the right fit for me uh, where it would be the right fit for somebody else. So it's naturally you stay up on what is new, what is the current lines of treatments for any of us that, you know, with um, relapsed until it happens. You know, you can stay you can stay current, but you should never really focus on it and obsess over, well, are we going to go this way or this way? And I just, I, tr I do trust my team. Um, I am, you know, with my local oncologist and I have a specialist down at Emory. Uh, they text, they talk. So I trust that they know when it happens, where I should be. Um, and that's really all I can focus on. Otherwise, you're right. You go down a rabbit hole and you worry yourself about, will this work? Won't it work? How are the side effects? And that's really all I need to focus on is, when it does, because it's not if, it's really when it does relapse. And, you know, every month to get a, to get my blood work every month, yeah, you wait that few days for your labs to come back wondering, well, is this the month? 
is this the month? And but at some point it will be the month that it happens. You know, you just got to take what they give and readjust to the new medication regimen. You know, I had to adjust to this current one. It took a little while, uh, but it, it it's working out fine. So I have no reason to believe that the next line of treatment, again, get a good response. So how about you, Mark, when you've um, discussed, you know, when you relapsed and, and trying to decide on your next therapy with your care team? Well, interestingly, I am kind of in that boat right now. Um, I've had a partial relapse. Uh, for the first time, my myeloma has come back in a very specific part of my body. And I just went through uh, a couple of weeks of radiation, which is a, a new experience. I'm still um, on the same therapy, which is uh, similar to Dave uh, da uh, Dara. I've had a very, very deep response six and a half years now. Um, which has been an amazing run. Intellectually, I knew it's not going to last forever. And as the years went by on Dara, I was like, man, I, this is just the gravy train because like, this is such a long response. I, I, I mean, I've been thrilled with how successful it's been with minimal side effects, but I knew it was going to uh, fail at some point that the myeloma would adopt as it always does. And um, I'm still on... Dara, I'm waiting to see if the radiation worked. To me, it's kind of a, a harbinger of that fact that um, we may be coming to the uh, end days of Dara for me. And so uh, fortunately, it's been a little bit of an elongated process. So I, I haven't had to make any sudden decisions. It's, you know, I've had uh, a while to let it sink in and uh, grieve for the potential loss of Dara, which has been my buddy for a while now. So yeah, you can kind of in your head think, oh, I, I know this is coming, but you know, when it happens, it's still, you know, it can be a difficult adjustment because it's a lifestyle change, right? There's going to be side effects. You're going to be very closely monitored. Your leash is going to be short. You know, it's just going to be very disruptive in terms of your lifestyle. And um, unfortunately, that's just part of the game with myeloma. So let's talk a little bit about these side effects. So you mentioned you're on DARA and, and you've found it to be pretty good. You really haven't had that many side effects from it. That, that's right. Yeah, it's it's been amazing. I get cramps, though, and I, I can't tell where that's, you know, I mean, I get calf cramps and I'm, you know, a big runner and I stretch and I take electrolytes and I, I just think it's got to be something with some of the, the drugs they're feeding me <laughs> That's the only real side effect if I if I can pin something uh, negatively on DAR. But how about you, Dave? Side effects from anything you've taken since you've relapsed? Mark's the first one that has said the same side effects as far as these cramps that mine mine occur right the soles of my feet and just they just cramp up for no good reason. I'm constantly drinking electrolytes, replenishing everything I need, and they still come and it's annoying. <laughs> it's it just definitely is just at the worst times, but that and and uh, fat it just the fatigue for me. Um, yeah, I've always been a high energy uh, run around, and I just I have no stamina anymore. When I'm working out, I know I have to space things out. It just hits me, and I know when I'm tired and when I'm just and I'm done. So um, my wife knows when I'm tired, just kind of keep me moving, and when I'm done, she just lets me crash out. But that's been the biggest side effect. And that took a while to get used to as somebody who just is used to running everywhere. So John, um, tell us about any side effects that you've had with some of the regimens that you've been on. And does that have any bearing on the drug holidays that you take? I mean, have you taken those because of side effects? You know, to some degree, yes, just because I feel the drugs, you know, uh, whatever drug I'm on, I feel it. I remember uh, when I first took Revlimid, which was the first, you know, drug that I took. I swallowed the pill and within like 15 minutes, it's like, whoa, I, I have something in my system that is really, it's a blockbuster. And it's, uh, and this is a feeling I've never had. And I can feel this, the power of this drug, you know, and I, and I love, you know, just feeling normal, you know, feeling normal is my high. And um, so, you know, when I'm on any treatment, even though they are, you know, a compared, 
comparatively to, you know, other cancers, you know, from what I understand, mild in terms of, you know, their, uh, their side effects, I still feel, you know, I feel different and, you know, fatigue for sure, but just, you know, not myself, you know, I don't really feel like myself. It's, I'm a, some kind of a chemical mix. So part of that, uh, the drug holiday enthusiasm has, has been, you know, because I just want to feel like myself. And for uh, most of the time I've, you know, had Dex in my regimen and uh, Dex really wax me and um, even tiny doses. Right now I'm on a four milligram weekly dose. I feel it, it just wax me, you know, and so, I hope I don't have to have Dex, you know, for the rest of my life. So, I mean, I'd love, I love it when I can, when I don't have to take Dex, right? And um, because I just, you know, puts me through the the ringer every week. But anyway, you know, it's part of the, you know, reality that we have. So let's um, talk a little bit about stem cell transplant. So all of you, so two out of the three of you have had them. Uh, and we don't really hear that much from patients who don't initially respond to transplant or who delay their transplant until after relapse. So let's talk a little bit about each of your um, experiences with stem cell transplant um, and, and maybe talk a little bit about the take home message that, you know, anything that you may have learned from that experience. So, so Dave, when you had your transplant, you it's almost like you didn't respond to it at all. Like you had a very, very short response and you relapsed almost immediately. So so when you talk to your care team about that, did they what did they t tell you about that? Did they just say that it was because your disease was too aggressive or, you know, it is is the message that if the stem cell transplant doesn't work, there's other things that that could be tried? Uh both of those. Uh, w when it did come back, since it, when my numbers came back, uh, when they retested everything, when they saw, when they saw those signs, it, it, it was back about, you know, tenfold over pr uh, previously when I was first diagnosed. So it came back with a vengeance and then I was told, well, it, it can happen. Um, they, they weren't, you know, they weren't floored from it because, you know, th there are cases, you know, people can relapse as, and even that quickly. And it was something that, you know, almost had to be tried. I know a lot of people are today, you know, a lot of people and patients nowadays are saying, you know, is a stem cell worth it? Is it shouldn't should it still be a first line of treatment? And, I, you know, if I had to do it again, I still would uh, because you just you don't know. You know, I, I could have had 20 years of remission from, sure. you know, that word, but that remission from one stem cell transplant. You just don't know until you try it. So I don't have any, you know, I know you didn't ask, but I don't have any regrets for, for trying it, for doing it. And from what my care team, uh, both doctors said, it's that while it can happen, um, it's just something you kind of have to deal with. So Mark, let's talk a little bit about your experience with transplant. Um, and you ended up having two of them. So just like sort of walk us through like what happened there. I did two autos. My daughters were um, six and eight when I was diagnosed. So I didn't like the uh, mortality rate associated with the allergenic. I wasn't willing to roll those dice. So even though I knew the autos were uh, ultimately less of a deeper, uh, not as deep a response, I, I went that route. I got my first one about six months um, after an initial diagnosis and a few therapies. And that was pretty much standard protocol where I was being treated. It didn't budge my myeloma numbers at all once we were finally able to test after a couple months. So they didn't jump, but they didn't go down. It was basically no response. And then we decided counterintuitively that since I already had enough stem cells stored from when I harvested originally, that we would just roll into a second one. I, I'm good at you know, pruning trees and climbing trees. I was an arborist, not a uh, myeloma doc. So I deferred to my team. And uh, we went into the second one about seven months after the first. And then I got a like deep two-year response. That's when I took my drug holiday after doing pretty much back-to-back -back transplants and yeah so talk to us about how talk to us about that and was it really hard on you to do that physically? 
Yeah, it was really tough. I was in the hospital for weeks and uh, both with the uh, Nupagen to stimulate stem cells that oh, was like the worst, <laughs> the worst flu, you know, the flu to a factor of 10. I mean, I broke, it felt like my bones were broken. And then once I spiked the fever with the transplant, I was back in. So I spent a fair amount of time in the hospital for both. Of course, I didn't have to harvest the second time, so that shortened that cycle. But, And I knew what I was getting into uh, after the first one, so the second one was a little easier in that regard. I Okay, I know the process. I know I'm going to feel like crap. I know my body's going to bounce back. So that was helpful. I would say, uh, for me, I think the transplants were a little oversold in, this, in the sense that uh, I think the actual um, success rate of them in terms of responses only is, well, I'm going to say only like 50% or something uh, uh, to the, in that magnitude. So, um, and I thought in my mind, oh, everybody does a transplant and it's this super arduous process, but it's because they're, it's amazing and it works for almost everyone. And that's not really the case. <laughs> you know, I mean, it still was the protocol at the time, mm -hmm. probably would have done things the same, but it, it, I was not really aware of the overall effectiveness. And the response times are usually, I think, like one to two years. So it's not like, which is a long time for myeloma, but there's very few people that get cured. I know there are people that have like had a, stand, a transplant and that's it. And they are like no treatment for even decades. But, you know, those guys are unicorns. So after my second one, I mean, it takes over your life, right? All the all the appointments and meetings and how closely they monitor you and holy smokes, it was like, it was a full-time job. So that's when I took my holiday. They were like, yeah, we recommend maintenance, you know, rev maintenance. I was like, nope, I'm, I'm casting off. I'm not going to see you guys for a while. So good luck. And uh, I'll check in at some point. I think I got uh, two years doing Zippo, nothing, no, you know, no, uh, no maintenance, no uh, decks, nada. And that was fabulous. And my philosophy is I just have so many magic bullets in my gun. I was like, you know what, if I, I got a response and it's, and it seems like the transplant's working, I'm not going to go ahead and fire another of my limited number of bullets to at, at my Loma. I want to keep that in reserve until I really need it. So that was like, mm -hmm. I think everyone, you have to develop your own philosophy. Most of the time going to follow the recommendations of my docs because that's what they do. They study this and, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. Still, um, I had to have an overarching philosophy um, and that helped me sort of make difficult decisions when we hit those crossroads. I got two years out of that. And then I, and then I went on rev, but yeah, those two years were fabulous. And now I know folks who are on CAR T and uh, it's basically a drug holiday. When my uh, uh, DAR stops working, I mean, at some point, I don't know if it's the next thing or I, you know, I presume most of us will probably get on CAR T at some point. And uh, I'm hoping I get a response and uh, can just cast off so did you um, did you run up against any uh, resistance from your care team when you told them that you just wanted to go on drug holiday and not go on maintenance? Yeah, they were they were okay with it. I mean, they really just gave me the um, space to make the decisions uh, I needed to do and and feel comfortable with. And I I, I really appreciated how they uh, respected my autonomy. John, your um, situation is a little bit different. So you opted to wait to get a transplant. So so walk us through that a little bit. What was your reasoning for waiting? And if you're approached by a patient who's considering a transplant up front, what learnings from your experience would you convey to that patient? When I was diagnosed and, um, and transplant was recommended for me, uh, you know, I, I recoiled in horror, was not convinced or persuaded that that was the right route for me. And particularly in light of the, you know, the novel treatments that were uh, coming online then and seemed pretty promising. My philosophy became to, you know, extend uh, as long as possible, um, you know, with treatments, with, you know, relatively benign um, treatments to just 
you know, try to treat this uh, gently and, um, you know, just kind of go for the long haul and uh, not go for the home run, but, you know, go for, you know, uh, just managing uh, the disease. And so that was, you know, that was my orientation. But I wanted to keep the uh, transplant as an option. So I collected my stem cells at the normal time. Uh, but I, I really hoped that I would never have to do it. And, you know, I got a lot of pushback from my care team because they do a lot of transplants and they wanted me to get into one. And so I just, you know, I had to kind of hold firm, but, um, but they did respect my choice. So we just, you know, carried on. But uh, at a certain point, it made sense to me to do it. So I kind of remained open to it, even though I wasn't oriented that way. I remained, you know, there was a little door uh, opening in the door. And, uh, and then when it got to a point where it seemed like maybe I should give it a go. Like, I think the thinking was, if I wait until I'm a lot older and a lot more decrepit, then, you know, maybe it won't really actually be an option. So at the moment that I was, you know, giving it serious thought, I thought, okay, well, I've been through a bunch of treatments now, and um, maybe this will be a good option now, but in, uh, in five years or 10 years, you know, maybe not, you know, maybe. Uh, and so it would be kind of a shame to, tr you know, to, to throw away one of the arrows in my quiver, you know, um, so I went for it, and amazingly or ironically, um, I got the best response of you know any treatment that I you know tried previously or since. Would I have gotten that response earlier on, and would that have changed the overall course of my you know of my disease? I don't know. I I kind of feel like you know since going through the uh, stem cell transplant, I do feel uh, you know diminished by it. And, you know, my counts are not, you know, my blood counts are not, uh, you know, what they were before. And uh, I feel actually my body has absorbed, you know, a fair amount now of, you know, um, insult and abuse. And, you know, over all this time, and I think, and I, you know, attribute a, a, a chunk of that to the stem cell transplant. So I'm, you know, I feel actually okay that I waited I think it was okay to do it. I think the research is not really definitive about early versus later transplant. I think the doctors are not so interested in that question, so they're not really pushing that research too much. But it seems to be, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a clear advantage to doing it earlier versus later. You know, and I feel like I'm glad, you know, I didn't uh, to put my body through that you know, earlier, but, um, but, you know, who knows, but I did get, you know, a decent response. I think, you know, the, the clones of myeloma that, you know, that I have, uh, that are active, I think, uh, they're susceptible to melphalan. <laughs> it seems like that's, you know, that's the reality. So, you know, unfortunately I have to take the old style cannonball to really, to really get it. Anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad I did it now. And, um, you know, um, and it seems to have, you know, had a pretty good effect. I mean, they just finished doing a really large study called the determination study on patients who got a stem cell transplant right away versus uh, patients who decided to wait until after they relapsed to have the, um, the transplant done. And basically what they found and why transplant is still the standard of care in myeloma is because the stem cell transplant does offer you the most people, it offers you the longest period of progression-free survival when you have it up front. Front. But they compared the overall survival of these patients who had it up front versus those who had it later, and there really wasn't any difference in overall survival in most people. So that's, it's still a little bit of a question, um, but you know, the progression-free survival, I think, is, is worth it for a lot of patients. So let's talk a little bit about clinical studies. Now, John, were you um, ever offered a clinical study, and, and have you been on any clinical trials? Yeah, I was on one. We were calling it SAR. Sarclisa, yes. Uh huh. So I was on a trial of that, and uh, it it only kind of sort of worked for me. 
And it was actually when I had that experience and, you know, and the, and my doctors were saying, well, you know, probably Dara is not going to work any better than that. So even though we haven't tried Dara and maybe, maybe Dara will work, you don't know, you know, and now, you know, now my body is different. I've been through, you know, stem cell transplant, et cetera. So uh, maybe it would work now, but, um, but the thing, the, the thinking was, okay, well, this isn't working. Probably Dara's not going to work. So that's when I stepped into the stem cell transplant. You know, that was, yeah. that was kind of the context for it. I enjoyed, uh, doing the clinical trial. It was interesting to me because I have a science, um, you know, background and I think philosophically I, you know, support it. And I, you know, I'm open to doing trials, you know, in the future as well. You know, if, if anybody wants this heavily treated, you know, uh, specimen uh, in their trial. Dave, were you ever on the clinical trial or offered to be on a clinical trial? Uh, I was offered. Uh, I was actually, a, a, I don't know the name of what, what they were using at, down at Emory for it, uh, but it was, it was supposed to be a trial for post-stem cell uh, maintenance. Uh, and I was just about to get started on it when everything came back. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do that. And then they did offer to, you know, they were looking to try to get me on a trial for the relapsed. And then, uh, but the, both doctors, uh, agreed that, uh, Revomid Dara would be better to, to go with. So I was, and so I wasn't able to start any type of trial, but as far as, you know, in the future, uh, I, like John, I'm all for them. Uh, I know the yeah. backgrounds with them. I know just how much they have to prove to get through on the trials. Uh, so yeah. I just, you know, I know with that background, uh, I am all for them. I will be happily, if there was one that is right for me, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'll be happy to, to jump into one if needed. Mark, how about you? Have you ever been on a trial or been offered to be on a trial? Um, no, I was asked to be part of a clinical research study that wasn't directly related to therapies. And I, um, I did that. And uh, similar to what Dave was saying, you know, I, I feel like as uh, myeloma patients, I mean, we have all um, benefited from past patients who have been willing to do studies. I mean, that's the only way that these drugs get approved or that mm -hmm. you know they're effective or not. And so our success is based upon other people's willingness. And so I am totally willing when that point um, comes. And I suspect it will, because I'm guessing at some point, unless they, you know, they, I mean, my doc talks about we're at CAR T 1.0 and it could still be curative, but we're, you know, it needs to be refined. And so if I'm not around by the time we get there, I, you know, I mean, that's, I think I will probably be on a, as I look at, maybe it's not the right way to look at it, but I look at uh, um, clinical trials as almost Hail Marys when you're out of options. And, um, you know, we all want another day, so I'm sure I'll be willing to go yeah. deep on, on that play. Yeah, that's. I guess that's one good thing about um, the field because, you know, there's always patients who sort of reach the end and they're refractory um, to everything, right? And the only thing that's that's suitable for them is like something that's in clinical trials, right? And um, and patients, you know, are like all you guys. They're all like, you know, interested in, in, in participating in these. And this is how we've gotten all of these newly approved therapies so far. And there's so many things that are in the pipeline that are still in trials. Um, so just never know what's going to happen next in this field. So it's, it's constantly evolving. I will say the advantage for me um, in my mind of being um, treated um, at a research center is that you do have access to those trials. I, I yeah. totally agree with that. Being being an Emory patient as well as local, uh, just the access to you know any of these research facilities, it, it's it's a blessing, and it's you, you just don't find that in you know in other parts of the world. Even in America, there's just areas where they're just they're on isolated islands and they just don't get access to it unless they're willing to make a lot of sacrifice to travel and you know talk about that leash being short when if you have to go through that it's, it's i just don't see how people can do that but to be able to be near a center like that and like all of us it's it's been great so let's talk a little bit about family 
while you're having these uh, treatments and relapses, et cetera. So um, Dave and Mark, you both had young children at the times that you were diagnosed. So talk a little bit with us about how you were able to let them know about your condition and were you able to involve them in any aspects of your care? Dave, let's start with you. Yeah, my, uh, my son was four, I think four when, uh, when I was diagnosed. And again, with my background, I was uh, currently at the time, I was in nurse practitioner school and working in neuro, uh, neurosurgery at the time. Mm -hmm. And so he knew what daddy did. Uh, he, he always had questions about medical, uh, you know, anything going on at work. So when I was diagnosed, we did not hide it from him. We, we were open with him. Uh, as much as you can be with a four-year-old, you know, with my treatments, he was very, uh, very attentive to uh, to me. Um, saw what I was going through. It, I could tell he was very scared, and he still has anxiety from it now. He's always asking how I'm feeling. You know, if I get up and I'm aching, you know, are you okay? And so it has affected him. I think being honest with him has helped. And during my uh, stem cell prep. He, uh, when I had my, uh, my central line placed, he was actually uh, wanting to help flush my line, change my dressings with me. He took an active role in that. Um, and then when I got home from the stem cell, I had no hair. Uh, he was with my parents during those two weeks so my wife could come down to the hospital and be more with me and present. He got on a FaceTime call with me when I got home. The day before he was gonna come home, they needed, you know, I wanted to be home for a day just to, settle in and it really, really shocked him to see me without hair. Um, and yeah, I think I that was like the first time I saw him just lose it. Um, yeah. But when he got home, you know, I had my hat on and he took it off for me and he was okay with it, but it's been hard with him, very hard. Mark, how about your situation with your kids and your diagnosis? My kids were um, also young, uh, six and eight. Our initial um, intuitive response was to try to protect them, um, which means like shield them from this reality. And then everything I read said, now you got to tell them. Mm -hmm. So I, it's even hard for me right now to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. So we, uh, my wife and I practiced um, to try to deliver it in a way that we weren't overwhelmed so we wouldn't scare the kids um, and do it in an age-appropriate manner. Um, and because they're different kids, they reacted totally differently. Um, <laughs> one daughter was, you could see, she was like kind of gut punch. My other daughter was like, okay, can I go play now? You know, I mean, they're, 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 uh, have distinct personalities. So, um, you know, we've tried to involve them in the process as much as possible. Like when um, I started to lose my hair for the first time, they got, you know, we got out the shaver and they shaved me. You know, they would visit me every day in the hospital during the stem cell transplant. I mean, I was felt so terrible, but I just and I didn't want any company except them. Like I had to see them every day and they would come mm -hmm. in fully gowned up. And, you know, eventually they got used to that. And I mean, it's amazing what you can adopt to, right? You know, it was like freaky for them the first time to come into mm -hmm. that hospital room, um, that germ-free environment. At one point, I think during my uh, older daughter's uh, high school, uh, she had to do a paper about medical stuff. So they actually, her and her friend came with me um, to an appointment and they saw um, you know, what it was like to get my labs drawn and, and my infusion or whatever I was going through at the time. And I think that was helpful because, you know, I would eventually as the years go on, it's like, yep, got my blood work. Everything looks good. It was sort of this abstract. I didn't look like a cancer patient anymore. You know, they got involved in their things. So to to be reminded that, yeah, this is still going on was um, interesting and and brought it back home. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't hide things from them. they they see how I just roll with the punches. it's It's hard to know what's going through their heads. And yeah. they're not kids. Now they're young adults, they're in college. But especially as kids, um, they don't have, uh, they haven't learned how to express themselves uh, uh, verbally um, like we have, even though they're more open in, in other ways. 
So I think just checking in with them, we had a lot of like family check-ins, little family meetings. This is what's going on. Um, and I don't know, we, we talk about it a fair amount uh, that, uh, cause we have um, used it as a springboard to live life, just suck the marrow up. We go on amazing trips and family vacations. And we spend a lot of time together, the four of us, because we don't take time for granted and we yeah. want to make memories. I want to make yeah. memories. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's, yes. that's my legacy. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I want them to be able to tell stories to their kids about uh, their granddad. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how we kind of flip the script and, and kind of have turned it into a positive by um, just not taking anything for granted and, and, mm -hmm. and large. Um, so let's talk about what you guys might see as like the next step in your journey and what um, words of wisdom or encouragement you might give to other patients who are sort of in this relapsed refractory state of multiple myeloma. John, I'll start with you, then we'll go with Dave and we'll wrap up with Mark. I think this people are still um, probably being told that everybody's myeloma journey is uh, is pretty unique. Um, everybody's uh, disease and response to treatment and so forth is unique. And that set okay with me. And I was comfortable with that. Um, but I think some people are maybe not so comfortable with that. You know, initially, they they're, maybe they're more familiar with other cancers where there's a standard treatment and you go through a standard protocol for a certain, you know, standard length of time and so forth and so on, and that this is quite different. And, you know, I guess to try to um, make yourself comfortable with that if as much as you can. I, I decided I wasn't going to get too hooked on the numbers, but I see a lot of people kind of hang off the numbers of their, you know, their scan results, their their blood work, and I think I think that's hard on you if you're if you're kind of living from test result to test result. I try just to put that out of mind, really, you know, and and also just like decide, okay, well, if it if the number goes up, then you know, not get too hung up on expecting and wanting a certain result, I guess. And kind of just being more open to uh, whatever comes, you know, however it works out and then just roll with it and but not try to anticipate too much. Try to, you know, just live life, you know, as normal as possible and trust that, you know, um, things will work out and, you know, life is just life. <laughs> Nobody in society is given a certain length of life or quality of life you, that you just, it's not, you know, it's just your life is your life. It's actually no different in myeloma and, and just, you know, be okay with that. Be, you know, sort of embrace that, even though we know we've got something that we think is going to be our demise, but I don't know, you know, I could get hit by a bus, to, you know, this afternoon. That's kind of what I would kind of counsel and is to try to just, you know, be in your life, enjoy your life, and um, not make myeloma a bigger part of it than, you know, than it really has to be. That makes sense. Dave? Well, I, I spoke at a uh, at a 5K for myeloma, one of the foundations, uh, 5Ks a few years ago. And, you know, I still hold on to what I said, you know, one part of it about when one f thing fails, there's going to be a next. And then, you know what, there's going to be a next after that and a next after that. So to continue to think of that way and to just um, to tie it in with, you know, when I was having a stem cell transplant and even to this day, just I was forced by, you know, my wonderful wife to get out of bed and walk that mile around the unit every day, you know, whether I wanted to or not, if you just continue to move forward and embrace life like john said embrace life you know take it day by day and enjoy it same with mark too just enjoy every mona make memories the myeloma almost you know goes to the side it's 
that's just a part of it, but it's not you. It's just, right. if you just continue, and that goes for anything, not just myeloma, just continue to move forward and things do work out. You know, again, so you just gotta, you know, you just gotta look at it that way. You know, some people say, oh, it's too, you know, it's, you know, too much rainbows and sunshine, but you know, what's the alternative? You know, am I going to sit here and, you know, wallow in it? You're right, John, focus on every number, you know, as far as the numbers go, you know, my advice from a nursing standpoint is you never trust one number. Don't trust one number. Don't trust that one set of, you know, labs that you get. We look for patterns, you know, oh, you have a high blood pressure. Okay. Let's take it again. You know, you have this, let's try it again. So, you know, when, when people live that month to month, week, whatever they're getting for their numbers, don't trust, you know, trust it, but don't trust it. Just look at it and go forward from it. See if there's a pattern, then deal with it. You know, it's either deal with it or don't deal with it. And you, nobody wants to not deal with it. You know, then we're not, nobody's here. So just take it as it comes. Mark? You know, I've heard some people say, you know, um, I don't want my Loma to define me. For me, I mean, it, it's a big part of my life. It's just, it just is. I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's not. I mean, it takes up a lot of time with doctor's appointments and sometimes in my headspace fighting to stay in the day versus projecting out and worrying and all that sort of stuff. So I have tried to embrace it um, as the new normal. I've gotten involved in support groups. Um, I've done a ton of fundraising. Um, I've been on these amazing fundraising expeditions and made incredible friendships. So um, in some ways it has, it has enhanced my life. I, you know, I can't lie about it. It's not like um, just this tragedy. I mean, I guess it's like anything in life. It's what you make of it. So making the memories, spending family time, telling people uh, close to me how I feel about them, um, not leaving any stone unturned, you know, those are all good ways of living. You know, we're all refractory patients if you're in the myeloma journey. I mean, there's just, you can't avoid that. And so, um, yeah, I would say lean on others, get involved and um, ask for help if you need it. And uh, once you are around for uh, a few, a uh, little while, um, offer help to others and be a mentor. Mm -hmm. Great advice. So this has been a, like a really fantastic conversation. Um, and I would like to once again thank our panelists today, John Bush, David Franks, and Mark Herkert for their time and for their stories. Um, I'm sure that a lot of patients will get derive great value from today's session. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Myeloma Matters podcast on relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma, hosted by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. The MMRF thanks David Franks, John Bush, and Mark Herkert for sharing their stories and unique perspectives on myeloma relapse. The MMRF also thanks AbbVie, BMS, Cure, Genentech, GSK, Janssen, Cariofarm, Sanofi, and Takeda Oncology for their generous support of this podcast. If you have additional questions about what you've heard today, please call the MMRF Patient Navigation Center at 1-888-841-6673. If you've enjoyed this series, be sure to leave a comment or review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening.